Victor, thank you to Sarah for hosting this discussion. It's been a very rich discussion which shows what an important and complex research agenda we have. So let me quickly try and make a few points which haven't already been made in the, the very interesting interventions so far. As Dirk has described, DFI has moved from the margins to the centre of the discussion on how to finance the SDGs and the climate change goals. And I think the climate change agenda will pull DFIs towards doing more in larger middle income countries. But the SDG agenda will pull DFIs back towards low income countries, most of which are in Africa. Now, these are the countries which have the least capacity to finance the SDGs through domestic resource mobilization. An analysis we published in 2019 showed that most middle income countries could close their SDG financing gaps with a modest increase in tax effort to finance public spending. Not so in the low income countries, so this is where increasing private investment can make the greatest contribution to the achievements of the SDGs. But these countries are also some of the most difficult environments to invest in. Not just because the business enabling environment is commonly weak, but because of the lack of investable firms. Now, by investable, I mean formal firms of sufficient scale and capacity to make use of external equity and take on long term debt and with prospects for profitable growth, which will enable them to service that debt and provide a return to investors. Such firms are the core clientele of DFIs. So if you want to understand the operations of DFIs today and in the future, I think you really need to understand their addressable market of investable firms. As we explored in our book, Making It Big, such large formal firms are essential to the growth of the private sector in lower middle income countries, but they, in my view, have not received sufficient attention either in research or on DFI investment strategy. They're often seen as predatory or sleepy. So DFIs like to promote their MSME financing, but we're often almost apologetic to talk about our investments in large firms. But the cure for predatory or sleepy large firms is not more SMEs, it's more large firms to compete with them, forcing them to become more dynamic. And more large firms means more opportunities for SMEs in their value chain. McKinsey has highlighted how few of these large firms there are in Africa. In 2018, there were less than 400 firms in the whole continent with revenues of more than a billion dollars a year, and most of those were in South Africa. So it turns out there isn't a missing middle in the private sector in Africa, there's a missing top. So this is both the opportunity and the challenge for DFIs in Africa. The opportunity is that DFIs have the financial and advisory products which large firms need to grow but the challenge is that there are so few of these large formal firms in low income African countries to begin with that DFIs can find themselves falling over each other to finance the same handful of firms. So this is an important driver behind IFC's recent strategic shift known as IFC 3.0. Recognizing that there aren't enough investment opportunities, we've shifted more of our resources into upstream market development and opportunity development. Now, we think there will be positive spillover effects from this work for other DFIs who will also benefit from the investment opportunities so created, and no doubt there will also be some grumbling about free riding. So what does this mean for a research agenda which will inform our work in Africa? I want to highlight two things. First, from what I've said, you can see that we need more research into the origins and growth paths of the large firms that we invest in. I think development research has neglected large firms in favor of MSEs, MSMEs, partly because if you study micro enterprises, you can get large enough sample sizes for RCTs and for statistical inference. Studying large firms in low income countries presents research challenges because of the small number of observations. But I think as researchers, you need to take on this challenge, which includes the hard work of getting access to business census data, tax records, and other information on the behavior of formal sector firms. And secondly, we need more research into the dynamics of market development. I'm afraid that too much of what passes for private sector development strategy is an exercise in comparative statics. You do a diagnostic of the business enabling environment or the financial markets or whatever, and then you say, okay, now we need to close the gaps or remove the binding constraints or fix the market failure. And you think the job is done as if it's moving from one static state to another. 
But as Dirk described, we actually need an understanding of how markets and firms develop together. At the sector level, this includes analysis of industrialization processes. At the micro level, it includes an understanding of the process of market entry, competition, innovation, and exit. And the ODI studies that Dirk was involved in on sector transformation, I think, are a good step in this direction. Okay. And this kind of research will help us figure out how to do the upstream opportunity development better. Lastly, I want to point out that in doing so, I think we could draw more on neo Schumpeterian endogenous growth theories. It seems to me that these theories ask the right questions about how firms and markets emerge and evolve over time. They put spillovers, network effects, clusters, innovation, and knowledge at the center of the growth process. We talk about these things in DFIs, but without a robust analytical framework. Surely many African markets are right for this kind of creative destruction, replacing a slew of unproductive, slow growing SMEs with a handful of productive, innovative large firms which compete internationally. So the question for DFIs is what is the sequence and set of complementary interventions working with government policy and public investments alongside DFI investment, which can promote this kind of restructuring of African economies? At IFC, we think this kind of market development is so important that we added a second dimension to our assessment of development impacts. In our AIM system, we rate our investments and advisory projects, both on their direct contributions to things like jobs created and services provided, and on their contribution to market development. And this then drives investment selection. To make these kinds of assessment more rigorous and credible, we need better research foundations which provide a basis estimating the market impacts of DFI investments. For years, we've relied on poetry, talking about catalytic effects and demonstration effects and crowding in, but we need more hard evidence on the existence and scale of such effects, looking at sequences of complementary activities rather than individual investments. There's no doubt that Africa will remain an area of strategic focus for many DFIs. And there's great scope for us to improve our effectiveness by improving our understanding of these important issues. So I'm glad to see talented researchers like Dirk and colleagues at SOAS directing their attention to these important research questions. Thank you.